podcast. Thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. It was really interesting to listen, and uh, I see we already have a few questions coming in. Our viewers and listeners are um, most welcome to keep asking their questions in the Q&A inbox. Uh, I have a question to get us going. You said that young people actually find comfort in uh, the system of two genders or this binary gender order. Now, a lot of us who work in social work, a lot of us who work with young people, um, would like to have some advice. What would you tell us? What would you advise us? Um, how could we work with young people in a way that accepts that people feel at home in a binary gender order um, and at the same time gives them space for more? I think that um, young people often see more than the two categories in their own lives. I mean, one, one works uh, I'm sh no, um, uh, always with, with what is within the bounds of the possible. Um, and, and that is to a large extent, not entirely, but to a large extent, um, depends on what young people have seen with their own eyes and heard with their own ears. Um, now that is likely to include quite a lot of gender variability, variation. Young people are, you know, apart from very young children, young people are likely to have seen different enactments of masculinity and femininity. Um, they've seen women being maternal, they've seen women being disciplinary, They've seen women who are preoccupied with their jobs, perhaps. Um, they've seen men who are uh, disciplinary, other men who are nurturant. They diagnose different styles of gender among their teachers when they go to school. These are things that children do see. They may not have a language for it. And that is, I think, where educators and uh, social workers um, can play a role in helping to um, uh, give language or um, pose questions that call attention to some of the, the variability and diversity in the actual world that the children live in. And um, therefore, um, you know, begin the, the recognition that, that other things are possible. I, I, this doesn't mean uh, getting them to read my textbook or uh, simply you know, telling them what gender is. Um, they will work it out for themselves. Um, uh, you know, once the possibility uh, becomes clear, um, and that also can be a, a collective process. I, I have a, an enormous uh, faith in young people's capacities to educate each other. Uh, it's one reason why I hate single sex schools, um, because it, you know, it, it radically reduces uh, the capacity for, um, for young people to educate each other about gender. Um, or to do so in a way that, that opens up, um, you know, gender learning beyond, beyond stereotypes. Um, so, of course, there are, um, you know, circumstances in which it's important for boys to huddle together or girls to be in a particular class together. That, that's legitimate. But uh, I'm very critical of imposing segregation institutionally. Uh, as as a way of life. Um, okay. Vielen Dank. Um, ich würde jetzt eine Frage stellen. Das kommt Thank you very much. Our viewers and participants keep 
uh, sending questions. There's actually one question I would like to pick out here, especially when we talk about young men, young men who are marginalized. There is a participant who says that these young men try to be hyper masculine and even might become violent. And perhaps because of their very masculine appearance, um, they uh, are also categorized in a very highly gendered way. So your opinion, uh, what would you say about marginalized young men with a hyper-masculine appearance, and possibly including violence? Yes, yes. Yes, I know there's a pattern. I, I have um, interviewed uh, some men of that description, and um, uh, my colleague James Messerschmidt in the United States has done some very good research on, um, on youth who do uh, in, in terms of questions of masculinity, youth who, whose lives have tipped into uh, actual violence, including sexual violence. Um, and, and I recognise the problem. Again, I, uh, I, I warn against a, a common tendency, not that I think this is uh, common among youth workers, but it's certainly common among administrators and mass media to stereotype um, marginalised young men as, you know, necessarily hyper-masculine. Um, you know, marginalised groups, say, you know, marginalised ethnic groups, um, African-Americans in the United States, Turkish origin, Turkish background youth in Central Europe, um, they include you know, the full range of masculinities. Uh, you know, there are gay youth in those communities. Uh, there are violent, hyper-masculine youth. There are a lot of people who are, uh, of young people who are just, you know, trying to get along in the middle of the road. Um, that uh, diversity exists in marginalised communities as well. But the particular problem you've put your finger on is, uh, is necessary to think about. Um, it's something I, I once called protest masculinity, uh, taking, borrowing a, a, a concept from the psychoanalyst Alfred Adler, um, the, who, who developed the concept of the masculine protest, uh, where in a world where power is masculinized and we still live in such a world, um, young boys and young men who experience powerlessness can respond. One, one understands the psychological uh, response here. One can respond by claiming masculine power for themselves by exaggerating masculinity and thinking that will yield uh, satisfaction and prestige. And in some cases, of course, it does. Um, in some cases, it's the, the tough, uh, potentially violent um, young man who gains prestige in a peer group. We see that uh, often. It's not always the case, but it can be the case. Um, it's not um, incidental, I think, that football, one of the more, and I'm thinking especially of uh, rugby and gridiron football, that is the more violent codes um, of football, um, which recruits um, you know, a very strong young men as players and the, where the play consists of bodies clashing against each other and overcoming each other by force. Those codes of football are surrounded, um, you know, by a, a, a mass of sexual abuse, exploitation, rape and, and harassment uh, of women. Uh, it, it's very striking a feature of football culture in Australia, I'm sorry to say. Um, 
So you can see that kind of mechanism that, that the claim to power through, in this case, a ritualized form of violence may actually work for some young men. But we also know, and, and here, research on masculinity in sport is really quite uh, significant. The number of men who can actually succeed in becoming rich and famous or even earn a good living um, through the embodied performance of professional sport is that pr proportion of men is very small. Um, it's a kind of confidence trick. Lots and lots of boys are taught these sports and engage in them as teenagers, but very few of them will actually get through to the professional level and few of those uh, will actually make serious money. Um, so it's it's a it's a trap actually for for many young men um, and it may help or all I can suggest is may help for those realities to become known uh, perhaps more widely than, than the mass media really really present them. Warum sagen Sie, das ist eine Falle für Why are you saying it's a trap for young men? There was a follow-up question as well on, on gender and sports, but you already answered this. Why would you say it's a trap? Um, it's a more because the, uh, you know, mediated sport, what we see on television, and what men who go into sports bars uh, will be surrounded by, um, <coughs> is actually the labor of a very small group of men uh, with very unusual physiques, um, you know, produced by, by years and years and years of, of training. Um, but that uh, mediated, that image of sport, of masculinized sport, is broadcast to hundreds of millions of, of, of you know, the audience, mainly men, but but not all, of course, because some women are fans too. Um, but there's a huge disproportion between the number who, uh, who begin to enter that world uh, as young boys or teenagers and the ones who will actually benefit it from it at the end of the day. I might also say that one thing which is hardly ever um, seriously acknowledged in the mass media presentation of sport is the long-term consequences of professional sport for men's bodies. And there is research on this. Most professional sportsmen, the ones who do get to the top, who do make a living, spend years, you know, crunching their bodies in one way or another, they, after they retire and are not earning anything more from that work, uh, they have often a lifetime of injury and damage to their bodies to cope with, a lifetime of pain often from the multiple injuries that their bodies have sustained. So it is actually, when I say it's a trap, it's almost literally one for, uh, uh, in terms of damage to bodies through entry into that, uh, that pattern of of uh, enactment of masculinity in sport. Another question, can men experience sexism? Yes, but the pattern of it is likely to be different and the consequences are likely to be different too. Uh, it is, for instance, possible for men to be raped. And indeed, in prisons, significant numbers are. And that can be a gendered experience. I mean, one of the patterns in prison life is a pattern of dominance and subordination where um, perhaps an older or more violent or more prestigious man um, takes the, the active penetrative role in sexual relationships, often with a, a younger, um, 
perhaps less experienced and, and less uh, violent man uh, as, as the sexual partner. Uh, that's a, a, a familiar enough um, experience in prison life and in some other social context, for instance, in migrant labor forces where uh, groups of male manual workers, mine workers, for instance, agricultural workers are obliged to live together very closely together. Uh, those kinds of relationships uh, also may develop. Um, that's one way that men um, can uh, experience sexism from other men. Uh, it is possible for women to stereotype men. Um, and it is possible, though I think not socially very common, for a woman who has greater power, for instance, as an employer, or um, uh, because of greater wealth, uh, to behave abusively towards men uh, through some kind of stereotype behavior. That is, that is possible. Um, it's a different pattern, however, from the institutionalized inequalities and uh, cultural you know, denigration of women that constitute the mainstream pattern of, of, of sexism. Thank you. Eine, um, person schreibt, Thank you. One participant writes that they would like to um, organize prevention of sexual violence at their school. Do you have any ideas of how this could be organized? How can this be done at schools? Yeah. Um, it's not something I, uh, a form of work I have been directly involved in. Um, and, and my first piece of advice then would be talk to people who have been involved because there are such programs. Uh, in fact, I might say there are quite a number of such programs in different parts of the world. Uh, I've read some very interesting South African research on that matter. Indeed, uh, if you would care to, um, to contact me by email through the organizers of the conference, uh, I can uh, give you some references to writing uh, about that issue and put you in touch with some of the researchers. Um, my my uh, general feeling about it um, is that if that, that such programs need to operate in at, at least two levels. Uh, one is by creating um, an overall school atmosphere or school culture, um, which makes a point of respectful relationships uh, between uh, boys and girls, um, male and female youth, men and women, which enacts respectful and equal relationships, which doesn't always happen in schools, but that's what a program should try to do, and which involves communities and parents in creating that atmosphere. So it doesn't set the school against uh, parents and communities, but involves them in, in the joint work of creating an environment that is good for girls and I would argue also good for boys. Um, but also it has to work at the more specific level of having, of having serious mechanisms for dealing with actual cases um, of sexual violence when they occur and not simply shuffling that off onto other authorities such as, as the police schools have to become involved in specific uh, responses to and, and that 
needs careful thought. Um, it needs appropriate professional um, engagement, uh, but it can be done. Hier passt die Frage vielleicht auch ganz gut dazu. Um, There's another question that fits in nicely. Um, how to deal with religions? One participant writes that religions often keep people trapped in patriarchal structures. I think this is true. Um, uh, in, in fact, we might um, uh, make that uh, uh, claim a bit stronger. Um, religious organizations uh, can be powerful and central bearers of patriarchal ideologies. And I know actually no mainstream religion of scale, uh, which is actively anti-patriarchal. And most of the you know, large religious organizations I know are themselves organized substantively in a patriarchal way. Um, so religious organizations, which I distinguish slightly um, from religion as, uh, as experience, um, you know, are bearers of uh, ideas that you know, um, <clears throat> may even require people to act in sexist and patriarchal ways. Um, that, uh, I think, becomes, you know, has obviously become a grave difficulty for feminists who have grown up in, in the context of religion, may continue to have a religious faith. Uh, it may put them sharply at odds uh, with the mainstream religious authorities, and we see that, for instance, in the Catholic Church, where feminists have been unwelcome to the hierarchy, but have continued struggles over many years. We see that in Islam. Um, I read from time to time uh, material put out by an organization called Sisters in Islam, um, which is a feminist Islamic group uh, who are engaged in contestation about the meaning of the the holy texts uh, and the proper their proper interpretation and and their proper application to modern life. Um, yes, that is a serious problem um, in changing um, patriarchal relationships and gender inequality on a global scale, and of course in in local communities too. And yet, religions can also be resources. Um, for gender justice. Um, and I, um, you know, I was brought up in a, in, in a Protestant um, context, a more or less Lutheran context, um, where the concept of, of, um, uh, of justification by faith uh, was, um, you know, it, conceptually uh, fairly central, uh, and where we were directed to read the works of St. Paul, uh, particularly those of you who come from a Lutheran background will know the significance of that uh, and the importance of Luther's lectures on the Epistle to the Romans um, in the history of Protestantism. Uh, well, St. Paul happened to write about this subject. I mean, he lived in a patriarchal society and he, uh, doubtless uh, reproduced patriarchal relationships, but he also said uh, in one of the famous epistles, in Jesus Christ, there is neither male nor female. It doesn't matter uh, who you are, what you are, there's neither slave nor master, male nor female. It doesn't matter where you are in the social hierarchy, um, if you have a relationship with the, the divine figure, that's what matters. Uh, and there are those kinds of resources in other, in other Christ, forms of Christianity and in other religions too. Um, so I do not rule out, I'm not 
simply, I'm against most religious organizations, but I'm not against most religions. Um, and I think we can find resources that, in fact, many people have. Sie hatten sich vorhin äh, so geäußert, dass Sie ähm, dem etwas... Earlier today, you said that you are a bit skeptical of uh, segregated education in schools. So boys and girls being taught separately. Um, now there is a question, what repercussions, or what, what consequences might this have for our work with young people? Uh, that, well, to have a separate boys' work and girls' work, uh, people having the choice to go to one or the other uh, group. Um, interesting question, and one I have not faced in my own work, uh, but I do have a view of it. Uh, I would uh, argue against uh, a major institutional separation between youth work with boys and youth work with girls. That is my argument for schools. I, segregated schools involve, create a major institutional gap between the education of girls and the education of boys. And I'm strongly critical of that. I think that is an educational mistake, a major educational mistake. Um, in youth work, um, uh, likewise, I would um, I, I would you know recommend against um, creating that kind of gap by your institutional architecture, um, by your major institutional arrangements. I do think there are situations uh, where it is appropriate for boys and girls um, to meet separately, to learn separately. Um, for instance, um, in early adolescence, uh, sexual education, education about menstruation, about um, the um, you know, issues around first ejaculation are probably usually best done in segregated groups because of the way those bodily issues are commonly understood in our society and the difficulty um, youth of that age may have in handling those issues in a mixed group. Um, but I would not. Um, rule out um, you know, the possibility of that kind of issue too uh, being dealt with perhaps after some separate discussion in a joint forum. Um, that also is, is a possibility that we may move backwards and forwards between separate groups um, and, and joint groups. Uh, I, that I would that I would admit. I mean, I I think I, I have a great deal of of confidence in. Um, I think you know most education is is improvised, and and I include here, you know, youth work by social workers as well as formal teaching in in schools. Most of that is improvised in transactions in face to face situations where you know, uh, judgments are constantly being made about what's what's the appropriate thing to do, how you'll help this group of kids learn at this point on this material. No one can prescribe that in advance. That's always being a, a matter of judgment. Uh, and, and that applies to any subject matter, any curriculum area or whatever, not just so, but, but certainly applies in social and sexual education. Um, and there are some cases, uh, you know, where it will work better separately, but there are other cases where it really matters uh, to share um, and to discover other points of view. Uh, for instance, around the issue of consent, you know, which is becoming quite a big issue 
in uh, um, in sex education in Australia at the moment because of various scandals about rape, um, including uh, a, a, a recent case of alleged rape in the National Parliament building. Um, this, uh, this is now a, a, a lively subject of debate. And I think, you know, though uh, some of these things will best be worked out, um, uh, in among girls and among boys, it's really important for issues of consent in heterosexual relationships also to become something that boys and girls can talk about between each other, but from in, in mixed groups, um, something that peer groups can, can deal with and form norms about that will provide guidance for, for young people when they're in situations where abuse might occur. Sie hatten vorhin auch die um, Popkultur angesprochen. You talked about pop culture as well. Um, on the one hand, I see that queer people are more present in popular culture than they used to be. So we have trans pop stars, we have people in popular culture that are queer, there's room for queer people in popular culture. But there's also a question, uh, and you address this as well, that in popular culture, you also have a very strong reproduction of stereotypes. How can we critically address such stereotypes in our conversations with young people uh, without coming across as uncool? Yes, good, good question. Um, but, you know, perish the thought that we should be uncool. Um, I think, look, um, I, I totally acknowledge that. <laughs> it's a good thing that our um, uh, that mass media, especially youth media, uh, is now more gender diverse than ever it was in the past, and uh, and that that is a good thing. I still think I would still argue um, that there is a massive gender stereotyping in um, in you know, com especially commercial electronic media. I mean, I, uh, I look at the, um, the advertisements for uh, television uh, or, or you know, cable uh, programs, which pass me on the sides of a bus or a train or a tram uh, around Sydney. And what do I see? I see, you know, heavy shouldered, um, uh, scowling he men who are engaged in violent physical combat uh, and I see slender blonde uh, carefully draped uh, you know uh, fragile young women um, portrayed in rom-coms and and uh, and dramas uh, so there's a hell of a lot of that stuff still um, and even I have to say in uh, in media representations of queer and trans people, there's a good deal of stereotyping. You know, young and pretty in conventional heterosexual heteronormative ways is the usual story for uh, people who become stars in pop culture, whether queer, trans, or cis. Um, so the, the struggles of your everyday trans woman uh, who doesn't look very suave or pretty, or the struggles of your everyday queer bloke uh, who you know, struggles to keep a job or to keep on good terms with his family, they're not really mass media material in, in, in the same way. How do we deal with that? Drama. Get kids to 
dramatize all of these issues, get them, um, you know, I have, I have great faith in education through drama, provided it's creative work in drama, not just, you know, keep on um, replaying Shakespeare and Schiller. Um, the uh, kids have, you know, often a, a wonderful uh, at producing, you know, short dramatic episodes to illustrate problems in their own social life. And often they enjoy doing this, you know, with, with video. Um, and some of it, you know, may well be worth circulating on video too. If you get them, for instance, think about the gap between what they see on screen and what they see around them in the flesh, that's one, you know, theme that you could do a lot with in terms of of dramatization of the consequences of that kind of kind of gap. Um, that's that's my, I'm you know I'm not uh, not any kind of uh, expert on on pop culture and the, the rawest amateur, uh, but but familiar educational techniques I think for stimulating discussions about these kinds of things and for getting kids to produce their own educational materials uh, would be very appropriate. Jetzt haben wir zwei Fragen, die ich so ein bisschen zusammen... Now we have two questions that I would like to take together. One is about the coronavirus. There's a comment that especially women bear the brunt of the coronavirus uh, load and charge, because especially in Germany, care work is done by women during lockdown when the daycares or the schools are closed. Um, there's, um, it's the women who take care of the children. There's even a hashtag, Corona is female. And the second question, what place or position does care work have in masculinity concepts? Right. Um, yeah, first of all, um, re-coronavirus uh, uh, 19, uh, COVID-19, the disease, um, you're quite right. Um, there is plenty of evidence um, that women have uh, taken more than men uh, have uh, taken up the extra burden of care work resulting from the pandemic. I might say that uh, men's care work also has risen, but women's has risen more. And it was unequal to begin with anyway. So uh, that point is perfectly right. And I think it is estimated that 70% of the medical health workers uh, uh, around the world are women. Um, so the frontline workers um, in the struggle with the pandemic are women. Um, it's uh, that in, in that respect, um, the epidemic has highlighted long-standing gender inequalities, um, which have not been, well, and we do not live in a post-gender world, in a post-patriarchal world, um, and uh, perhaps have, um, have helped to, to make clear the, the significance of, of care, uh, to dramatize that, uh, in public in, in a way that is, I think, in the past has been hard to do, simply because of the, the private character of, of many settings where care, care work is done, i.e. In, in homes. Um, that said, um, I would argue that it has been more common um, in um, public representations of masculinity to show men doing care work, especially in relation to children. It is now more common to see images, for instance, of fathers 
pushing their children in a pusher or a pram. Um, and um, it is, uh, you know, it is something that some politicians take care um, to have images of themselves doing care work, especially with their children, uh, available to, to circulate through the media. Um, it, I think it is, you know, uh, that is a theme that uh, many of, uh, you remember in my talk, I mentioned the Men Engage International Network. Um, in uh, a number of those organisations in that network, uh, men's care work, particularly as fathers, is actually a major theme in changing masculinity. Some of those organisations are in fact precisely focused on uh, especially young men's care work um, as fathers, young men's relationships with children. And that seems to me a very, very promising area to work in, a uh, promising theme uh, to emphasise. That has not, I think, been uh, yet uh, translated into, um, you know, the kinds of power structures I was talking about at the, um, uh, at the beginning of my talk. We don't generally see uh, Mr. Putin or Mr. Xi or Mr. Modi looking after taking care of their grandchildren and spending time uh, playing with young children, uh, let alone changing the nappies uh, or doing the cooking. Uh, we don't yet see that. <laughs> and that is perhaps a, a measure of the the distance we still have to go before we have ended patriarchy in full. Very often, the problem is that men might want to take care of their children or do care work, but as soon as their career has got going, they can't take a break for, for job reasons. Right, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. We're getting a lot of questions. Um, I will take one of the questions that came in last, and I'd like to come back to daycares and schools. What advantages and disadvantages does gender neutral or gender open education have? What could this look like? And how would teachers have to be trained and educated? What can teachers do? What can they contribute? Um, I'm not sure if there's a specific kind of program in your mind uh, with this question. Um, but um, I, I, my view is that we should not attempt to eliminate gender from our speech um, or um, if you like design a curriculum to be simply gender neutral. Uh, my reason for that well, there are two reasons for that. One is that um, children and youth experience gender in many ways outside the school curriculum. And if we, if you like, refuse to acknowledge gender in the curriculum, there will be a, a gap of credibility created, frankly. I think gender has to be dealt with, has to be, I mean, it's there in the curriculum all the time, uh, really. Uh, you know, we study literature. All literature is gender. I mean, it talks about gendered people. I mean, it's written mostly by men and women uh, as writers have a specific place in it. All movie, all film, history of film is strongly gendered and so on and so forth. Um, 
you can't actually have a, a, a rich and comprehensive curriculum without dealing with gender. That doesn't mean you have to reproduce gender in it, but you have to deal with it. It has to be part of what children learn about and think about and, and work out ways to deal with. So um, what, I, what I would see as positive or what I would think of as a, as a, a, a good gender neutrality strategy in childcare and schools is to refuse to treat the boys and the girls differently. Um, so I'm wholly in favour of you know, gender neutral, gender common might be a better way to put it. Um, uh, language in addressing kids. I mean, the traditional thing that a teacher said at the start of the day was, good morning, boys and girls. Always saying boys first. Um, well, you don't have to say that. You can simply say, good morning, children, and you're inclusive from the start. Okay, that, that kind of thing, uh, that kind of, you know, common treatment uh, can simply become natural. Uh, in our speech, and that doesn't deny gender, um, but it doesn't enforce it, if you like, and and that I think is the the, the main the main argument that I would make. The other point that I would make, and, and this is a little bit more difficult, um, um, is that education to me uh, one of the functions of education, not the only one. But one of the functions is to transmit culture between generations. And our historic cultures are strongly gendered. So, you know, if we read Goethe, we read Shakespeare, we read, um, you know, the Mahayana, um, we read no or, or enact no plays from Japan, we're dealing with gendered texts. Um, uh, we are engaging with a gendered history. I don't think we should deny that. And we don't, I don't think we should deny kids access to that through their, their education. Um, we don't, once again, we don't need to push it down their throats. Uh, we don't need to force gender on them, but having access to the wealth of global cultures is part of what a good, good curriculum should do. That history is gendered. We therefore, good educators therefore will deal with it and deal with it you know, in a, an appropriately reflective and sometimes critical way. I, I don't, um, I think that's what good educators do anyway. And um, um, certainly some of my educators did that kind of thing for me, and, and I hope that is, um, is still possible. Ich habe jetzt noch mal die Bitte, um, dass Sie bitte noch mal einordnen sollen. There was another request in the chat. Uh, could you please talk about boys' work and girls' work a bit more, separate groups for boys and girls? Because there was a comment that again, um, there is a binarism in there. Trans persons, um, intersex youth are excluded again. What would your proposal be? I haven't thought carefully about this. Um, so uh, what I have to say is, is rather improvised. I've argued that we should not institutionally segregate boys' work from girls' work, um, that we should have open um, the possibility for specific groups and circumstances, um, but uh, we should also um, have open and be comfortable in often using combined groups um, and stimulating dialogue 
between boys and girls. Um, that suggests to me we might um, have the same logic for people who don't, for young people who don't easily or even partially fit into either of those kinds of, any of those kinds of groups. Um, it, it, you know, I can think of many situations where it would be helpful uh, for intersex young people to be able to talk to other people, other intersex young people, um, where it would be helpful for young people who have been brought up as boys, but who feel themselves as girls or future women, to be able to talk to others who have the same similar feelings or the same trajectory. So trans girls might, you know, have common experiences and problems that are worth working on together. Trans boys, likewise. Um, young people with, you know, what are now called queer identities might also have common ground, but there may also be possibilities for dialogue across those, those groups and, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of an architecture of multiple differences emerging and recombining, coming back together. Um, might be a way of thinking about a program that recognised gender diversity, but didn't force it on, on people. Um, how that could be done in practice, I have no practical experience, so I can't really say. Um, but, you know, some of the youth support groups that I do know of for uh, queer youth, and for trans youth would be a place to start, how they might be connected with groups of young people thinking of themselves as straight, or um, people don't normally think of themselves as cis, but who have not had any kind of trans impulses. Um, those kinds of connections are also worth thinking about and, and may become possible in a if you like, combined boys and girls youth work framework. Eine Frage ist, ob Sie denken, dass es there is eine... one question. Um, do you think that there can be a world without gender? Is a world without gender possible? It's possible, it's imaginable. I don't necessarily want a world without gender. What I want is a world without gender inequalities. Uh, with, uh, I want a world with gender justice. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't see anything inherently objectionable uh, in, in, in recognizing that, you know, sexual reproduction, uh, plays a large role in human life, um, that social forms are related to, to that aspect of, of human embodiment, um, that those connections may ramify in many different areas of life. Uh, that's what I take gender to be, and I can't see anything inherently objectionable in that. What is to me objectionable is when those relationships, those patterns um, become structures of inequality, of hierarchy, of privilege, exclusion, exploitation, and hence our sources of violence and abuse. That's what to me has to end. And we may, if, if, if we can find ways to end them, we may have a future that is gendered, but gendered in richer and more, you know, more interesting in multiple ways than the world we're in now. Um, some science fiction uh, is quite interesting in, in imagining societies with multiple genders. Um, 
science fiction often can be a way of stirring the imagination a little. Um, it's not necessarily a blueprint for anything, but, um, but thinking beyond what is given is, is often a very helpful thing to do. Und was können wir alle dafür tun, um in diese Welt And zu what can we all do in order to bring about this world? Smash the patriarchy. Uh, contest, contest <laughs> inequalities everywhere they appear. Uh, join your union. Uh, you know, uh, struggle with the powers of darkness. Uh, wherever they appear. Uh, there's thousands of ways that we can contest inequalities and abuses in, in our gendered lives. Um, some of them, you know, small and inconspicuous ways, uh, like changing the way we address a class to, uh, to create common ground rather than emphasize division. Uh, some of them very big, Uh, such as contesting, um, you know, state control of women's bodies um, or uh, economies that are based on the exploitation of, of women's labor and the segregation of exploited labor for men and, and for women. Um, there, are, there are many levels at which we can do those kinds of things, but I think, you know, we, we always start with and come back to daily lives and, and immediate relationships, families, workplaces, um, leisure, um, personal relationships. Uh, those are all arenas where we can work towards a, a world of, of equality and justice. I sound like St. Paul. Vielen herzlichen Dank, das war doch ein schönes Schlusswort. Thank you so much. Great closing remarks. Uh, we have a lot of questions, but I think we can't take them all. You have to come back. Maybe next time in person, not just virtually. This would be a great thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us, Raven Connell. Wonderful that you were here.